So what does it take for us to be awe-inspired? Awe doesn't have to be, and it can be, look at those mountains. Are they not beautiful? That brings me off. Steve Grant mentioned to me this morning, nature, and I was like, yes, that, like, if there's any way that I could immediately be in awe of God, it would be driving through Garden of the Gods or sitting in a still lake, listening to the birds. Like, those moments are awe-inspiring. Um, but awe can also come from a different feeling with it. It's not always uh, seeing the good, sometimes even seeing bad, like, just something enormous, right? I was thinking on the way here this morning, we went to South Dakota of like over spring break. And I already shared with you guys, um, but a lot of people knew to me in this room. We were coming back and almost got hit by a car. We almost had a head-on collision because this, this car was trying to pass a truck. It was a two-lane highway. We're going 65 miles an hour. And the car passing was coming at us and was not backing off or speeding up or, um, and they had just crested this little hill. And we just looked up and were like, Okay, and Josh basically, you know, got us down the, there's like a drop off to the, there's no shoulder, right? There's just grass and field and it kind of drops off and how we did not flip that car is a miracle that God holds in his hands. Um, but we evaded that situation and came to a stop and looked back and that car was flipping. And they had, I guess, tried to evade us too, maybe later than they needed to because they would have been fine if they hadn't and they just flipped and flipped and flipped and, um, stopped short of hitting a pole in the ground and they were ejected from the vehicle and we had to stay on scene for two and a half hours while Flight for Life came. It was a little traumatic. Um, I just drove back that way. My mom and my sister and I met at Lake McConaughey, Nebraska to go camping and we passed that way. And I knew we were gonna pass it so I <clears throat> I checked the notes in my phone because um, I, had, I had put a little star, I had hand drawn a star on a picture of the map, so I would, I would be able to go back there someday, because we didn't look enough around. I was curious, you know, how it all played out, and I wanted to stop someday. So, we're coming up on it, and I mean, I'm a mile out, and all of a sudden, my heart just starts racing, and like, the adrenaline just shoots up, and I can't breathe, and my mom's like, are you okay? And I'm like, i just thinking about the accident, and like, I couldn't, I couldn't handle the moment. I mean, it happened a couple months ago. And I know that's not the same as what we think of God, but that internal visceral reaction is what I'm going for here, just to have something well up inside of you that is just unovercomable, that, that takes you somewhere else, that, that you can't fathom what is happening. That's what we're going for today. I think that even stuff in the vineyard like healing and miracles, you know, maybe maybe before you ever heard that those things were still happening in the world, because I grew up in a church where um, Jesus was great and God was great, but the Holy Spirit was sort of like the, you know, I don't know, the unseen step uncle or something, and we never talked about him. Um, when I first came to the vineyard and heard, oh, healings do still take place. Oh, when we pray for people, sometimes God will still touch them and grow limbs. Um, people are raised from the dead. And like this stuff happens, uh, there's some awe that happens in that, but the more you see even amazing miraculous miracles, miraculous miracles, um, the more that you can become complacent to it. Like it can become pretty normal. You might have like an aha moment with it. Oh God, that was amazing. Um, but then it goes back to the day to day pretty quickly after that. So today I wanna to focus on God, creator of the universe, Creator of man and woman, all things scurrying and scuttling about, and try, though my efforts may be futile, to paint a picture of who he is and try to help us rediscover some awe for him. Certainly we can all agree that God is a being we should stand in awe of, but how to grab his bigness, how to understand his creativity, his capability, the capacity he has for love, his unendingness. It can feel futile to both try to understand him and stay in this ongoing state of awe. I know for me, this struggle usually results in God ending up in a more easily proportioned box in my mind until I find him there and decide to let him back out again. <laughs> the box analogy is meant to convey that sometimes we keep God within the parameters that we can touch, feel, and experience. 
so that we can relate to it in our terms with an easier but vastly limited understanding. Though he clearly does not fit within any parameters that the human mind could fathom, we, out of a type of relational desperation, often create a version of God that is more palatable to our limited senses. We want to relate to him. We find ourselves thinking that to do so, we must understand him. Let me ask those of you who are married, do you understand your spouse? No. <laughs> I see no hands coming up. Josh and I have been married 23 years, and I guarantee you he still doesn't understand why I inexplicably know every movie I do not want to watch on a Friday night, but I do not know which movie I do want to watch. <laughs> we can invest a lot of time and energy decades into trying to get to know another human being, but never fully get there. And I think that should just give us a tiny clue of how we're never going to understand totally the creator of the universe and the father of all mankind. So let's pry a little bit more at that box that we may have created in our minds and scratch at a big concept. What is the Trinity? <laughs> Diana's laughing because she knows this is there's a, this is a big this is a big box to open. So we know from Scripture that Jesus has always existed. The Holy Spirit has always existed. They coexist with the Father and they rule as one. Some great verses to give us a little insight. John one one. I brought this up before, but our Josh is in my youth leader. We met in high school. Um, she drilled this verse into our minds. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, the word for word is logos here. It is literally the spoken, logical word that created it. It is believed to be Jesus himself. Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Isaiah 6.8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? When God speaks, he often uses pronouns like us to describe himself. This is because as we have discerned in our Christian faith, he works so closely with the other two members of the Godhead, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, that they exist in the closeness of relationship that can only be understood by looking upon them as a single being. In prior sermons, I've, I've uh, described how the Godhead and the Trinity works by talking about this beautiful ebbing and flowing in a dance they just do together, where they're always stepping the same. But I asked Joshua his opinion, and he said, it's like a Venn diagram. And I think that actually works really well. You can see the separation, and you can see where they overlap and work together. We don't want to uh, misstep and not realize that they are individuals as well. They're separate but one, unique individual beings, but they function in wholeness, in unity, towards the same purpose. It's in light of this theological stance that we're going to continue my talk today. I'm going to speak of God the Father as an individual that I believe is often hiding in our minds behind the ever-present and much more well-understood Jesus. As we aspire to reignite our awe for God the Father, I find myself calibrating the starting point where today's typical Christian perceives him and... Uh, this is what I think happens sometimes. As American Christians, we do tend to put most of our stock and focus in Jesus. He is our savior, he's our redeemer, our lover, the one who's experienced our pains and trials, the one who heals and raises people from the dead, amen? I'm not minimizing Jesus at all, but he tends to get the lion's share of our attention when he is in reality an equal player in the Godhead. You can see why we naturally focus our attention on Jesus. He took the keys of death from Hades. He's our direct path to God. Through persecution, temptation, and even through death, he will reunite us with the Father. Jesus came to save us. Or maybe more accurately, Jesus came to reunite us with the God who is already working to save us. This, I think, in light of the Old Testament stories that most misinterpret to be about a vengeful God, is imperative to realize. God has always been working to save us. He has always loved us deeply. Let me add to this list, as vastly nearsighted as it may be about who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who points to God the Father. He says, if you knew me, you would know my Father also. So even Jesus is trying to point us back to God. And that's what I want to do today, is just kind of look back to God the Father. Um... We're always going to look to Jesus to 
teach us who God is and how to relate to people in the world. But for today, I'm going to quiet that focus a little bit to reorient us with the Father. God has always loved us. And we heard that in the words that came up today I thought was perfect for this message that I'm sharing. In the beginning, he said we were good as soon as he created us in Genesis 1-3. He created man and woman, and he said they were very good. He has always pursued us. See, for example, his endless patience for those who followed him, notably the Israelites who were freed from Egypt and continually still built idols and disobeyed commands. Jesus isn't the one who made God love us. Jesus is the one who stood on earth in the flesh and lived out God's eternal, already existing love. All right, let's try to further pry open that box that we might have God in. God is the one who terrified Egypt, Jericho, King Nebuchadnezzar, the Philistines, when David killed Goliath with a single stone. I just want to look at these stories where we imagine, just for this morning, that we had no idea who the God of the Israelites was, and that we were living in one of these communities when he showed up. So let's join the exodus from Egypt, already in progress. If you were an Egyptian 1,200 to 1,500 years before Jesus came, you would have been living alongside the Israelites for the last 400 plus years, and you would have known that they settled in your land after a famine where Joseph came and negotiated with Pharaoh to, to feed the people, which in turn got Joseph's family to come, um, including his father and brothers, and his father being Jacob, also known as Israel. And this is where the Israelites' story begins. In Exodus 1 6, it says, Now Joseph and all his brothers of that generation had died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increasing in numbers, and became so generous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. To end with Pharaoh commanding um, that the children born to the Israelites needed to be killed. And Moses, of course, being saved by Pharaoh's daughter and growing up to later redeem the situation. So as an Egyptian, because that's who you are today for this talk, you knew no one more powerful than Pharaoh and no one more feared he ruled with a cruel scepter, and his wealth was unmatched as far as we could see. But you also knew, living aside this nation of slaves, that their quiet grumblings of oppression had started to grow. This political moment in time was one of discontent and instability, as the nation of slaves began to grow more and more in number. Then this thing happened where a freed Israelite named Moses began asking Pharaoh for a favor. He wanted to take his people and leave the area to worship their god. Well, Pharaoh was not going to yield his power to this nation of slaves. He displayed his power by making them work even harder. The Israelites would now have to build their bricks without the straw already supplied. They would have to have the same quota to go and find their own straw. But as Pharaoh put his foot down, the God of the Israelites showed up to counter. Whatever Pharaoh did to resist the freeing of God's people, God would overcome with a swift torrent of one plague or another. As you lived under this reign and knew it only as the ultimate power, it terrified you to see the world around you unraveling as plague after plague hit your beloved home and you saw a new power. Soon word was spreading that it was the God of the Hebrews, the Israelites, that was doing these things. Pharaoh was being challenged by another, one more powerful than you had ever known even existed, one unseen yet unrelenting. You did your best to protect your family and livestock, but after the water went sour with blood, the land was overrun run with frogs, gnats, and flies. Disease and boils affect, infected and laid weakened the livestock as well as your neighbors far and wide. Hail and locusts decimated all of your upcoming harvest, and inexplicable darkness covered the land. You began to pray to this unknown God to spare your family. 
we began to grow an awareness that no human being of any kind was more powerful than the God of the Israelites. He wailed loudly from your torment and wondered when Pharaoh would see that he had been proven insignificant in the midst of this giant God. And would Pharaoh just surrender already? Then the last plague came. God took the firstborn from every home. As we see in Exodus 12, 29 through 30, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. This God could give life, and he could take it. He took a life from your house, your friend's house, and even the great Pharaoh's house. This is where I want us to stand. I love cloud and storm pictures, so when I saw this, like, to me, this is God's raw power. You guys might have a different picture of mine, but I'm the one with the mic. <laughs> <laughs> if we were to look on God's power afresh, from not knowing him at all, to seeing his awesome glory and power reigning over the earth, we would be standing in utter awe. We would have a full grasp of his bigness and his power. And as for the vengeful God of the Old Testament, though it seems counterintuitive, as you watched the plagues unfold in your homeland of Egypt, you would have still had a sense of God's unrelenting love. As you watched the catastrophes destroy all of Egypt, one thing remained clear. Those who followed God stayed under his protection. He came to earth in a torrent of power to free those he loved from oppression and tear down any walls that kept him from his beloved. But I'm hoping that we can embrace today is to let God out of the box, to see him with a sense of his raw power and his endless love combined. He is not hateful and vengeful. He is full of love and raw power, and he is for us. This is where the modern American Christian faith has failed us so many times. We are directed to look towards Jesus, the soft and loving friend and savior, without binding him irremovably to the relentless love and raw power that is God the Father. They are one and the same. And combining this understanding with our well-developed vineyard awareness of the Holy Spirit, we will be a powerhouse of believers, sure-footed in who we represent. And what endless power, protection, and provision follows us wherever we go. I just wanna take a minute, to have us close our eyes and give some space to the Lord to be big. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to help us see what we don't always see. Give us a taste of what we could never comprehend. God, we just ask you to appear to us in a new way today. He's showing you mountains or maybe he's showing you things in your life that happened a long time ago that you suddenly remember that he helped you overcome against all odds maybe he's showing you a situation not yet overcome and giving you vision that it will be so that god will reign over it and that hope should not be lost Maybe he's showing you the face of somebody that you need to talk to with a new conviction that the one you're talking about can save them, can turn their heart, and does love them. God, we stand in awe today. 
thank you for who you are as the Godhead. 3B, showing us how to live in unity. All working together for each one of us. Working together for me. And we thank you for a new understanding of your eternal goodness and love. God, walk with us today. I think it's important for us as we're trying to go out and minister to people around us that God's in his right place. So it's really hard to go to your neighbor and be like, Jesus loves you, and, and not know the power that is behind that and, and the love that is behind that. I really think a lot of our foundation in this church comes from our, our good scriptural understanding of who it is we serve and who loves us.